Ever since human beings first created communities, we have also invented laws to govern the safety of our citizens. But no matter which day and age you live in, there are always was and will be those who are more than willing to break those laws. Whether it be done through stealing, arson, vandalism, blackmailing, or etc. There are those out there who are more than willing enough to break the mold that society has created and do something for their own personal gain. However, out of all the criminals out there that have sparked the interest of psychologists, there is still one type of criminal that is more devious than the rest of them. I'm talking in the case of serial killers. Now... Keep in mind that not all murderers are axe-wielding maniacs who are just standing around waiting for the next kill. Unfortunately though, there have been plenty of killers in the past who have murdered on more than one occasion. So much so that the local press and media got involved and covered the story so unbelievably well that many of them have actually gained cult followings and even celebrity status. Throughout the times, serial killers have also written back to the media and press in order to further escalate their already overbloated and insane egos. So with that in mind, let us take a look at some of the letters that were written by famous serial killers. Number 5 Donald Harvey. Donald Harvey served as an orderly in hospitals in Ohio and Kentucky during the 1970s and 1980s. It was during this time that he found creative ways to poison at least 30 patients before he was found out. Harvey had been given the nickname Angel of Death by a co-worker because he always seemed to be nearby when a patient died. Harvey sent this lengthy letter to someone who wrote to him in prison in 1998. Lord, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to hide the bodies of those people I had to kill because they pissed me off. Number four. The Zodiac Killer During the late 1960s and early 1970s, the Zodiac Killer terrorized the San Francisco Bay Area, although only five murders were confirmed to be the work of the Zodiac. Letters that were allegedly from him took credit for nearly 40 murders. His identity remains unknown. These letters were sent to reporter Paul Avery in 1970. Avery had been covering the Zodiac case for the paper. This is the Zodiac speaking. I am the murderer of the taxi driver over by Washington Street and Maple Street last night. To prove this, here is a bloodstained piece of his shirt. I am the same man who did in the people in the North Bay area. The SF police could have caught me last night if they had searched the park properly instead of holding road races with their motorcycles seeing who could make the most noise. The car drivers should have just parked their cars and sat there, quietly waiting for me to come out of cover. School children make nice targets. I think I shall wipe out a school bus some morning. Just shoot out the front tires and then pick off the kitties as they come bouncing Number three. out. Dr. H. H. Holmes, Herman Webster Mudgett, 
born May 16, 1861, and was executed on May 7, 1896, was a bigamist and con artist. Throughout his life, he would later become America's first documented serial killer. H. H. Holmes would go on to confess to more than 27 murders during his lifetime. However, only 9 of those murders could be confirmed due to the fact that many of the people that he claimed to kill were still alive. On a side note, H. H. Holmes is mostly remembered for his notorious Murder Castle, a hotel that he built in Chicago during the 1880s. The castle's purpose was built to lure in tourists in hopes that he would be able to kill them with poisonous chemicals inside their rooms and steal their personal IDs in order to help him commit more insurance frauds. He was later captured and while he was on trial, H. H. Holmes was given the opportunity to tell his life story in a local newspaper. He sent various different notes to a local journalist at the time period. Here are some of those chilling letters that he sent. Transporting a dead body. This delay was for the purpose of giving me a chance to freshen my subject up a little. Ice was not procurable and as there was no drugstore in the town, I went down to the grocery store, got the proprietor up, and bought several bottles of ammonia which, when combined with one or two other simple things, made a solution that rendered my quiet friend quite acceptable. So far as one's all factories were concerned. The devil. I was born with the devil in me. I could not help the fact that I was a murderer, no more than the poet can help the inspiration to sing. I was born with the evil one standing as my sponsor beside the bed where I was ushered into the world. And he has been with me ever since. Number two. Jack the Ripper is the best name for an unidentified serial killer, generally believed to have been active in the largely impoverished areas in and around the Whitechapel District of London in 1888. He is very, very famous for his surgical cutting skills with a knife. He murdered several prostitutes during this time period and was believed to have never been caught, nor does anyone actually know his actual name, which is one of the reasons why he is so infamous and well known around the world. But during his time, Jack the Ripper wrote several anonymous letters to the press trying to invoke his desire for fame spreading fear amongst the people of the Whitechapel districts of London during those years. Here is one of the most famous letters he has ever written. Mr. Lusk, sir, I send you half the kidney I took from one woman, preserved it for you together piece I fried and ate it. Was very nice. I may send you the bloody knife that took it out if you only wait a while longer. Signed, catch me when you can, Mr. Lusk. And finally, number one. There are many tragic stories of innocent people losing their lives to sick and depraved human beings, but it's also more tragic when that victim is the life of a small innocent child. Which leads us to our number one serial killer on the list, a masochistic cannibalist slash necrophiliac slash child molesting slash pedophile slash serial killer Albert Fish. Known to the people of New York City in the 1920s as the Vampire of Brooklyn, Albert Fish had a sick fetish for kidnapping, raping, mutilating, torturing, killing, 
and devouring the bodies of little children. Aside from harming others, Albert Fish enjoyed inflicting severe pain on his own body. It wouldn't be uncommon to watch him whip his own back with a strap so badly that he would have to be hospitalized. Albert Fish would do this to his own body for sexual entertainment. Not only that, but it should be noted that he shoved so many pins into his own scrotum that when the law enforcement finally executed him in prison through the electric chair, they had to do it more than five times because the pins kept shutting off the electrical currency. Albert Fish would have gone unnoticed if he hadn't written a letter to one of the parents of his own victims. In the letter, he describes in great detail what he did to their daughter. It also must be noted that Albert Fish was considered a family friend of theirs at the time, and they often trusted their daughter in his care. Here is the letter. My dear Mrs. Budd, in 1894, a friend of mine shipped as a deckhand on the steamer Tacoma Captain John Davis. They sailed from San Francisco to Hong Kong, China. On arriving there, he and two others went ashore and got drunk. When they returned, the boat was gone. At that time, there was a famine in China. Meat of any kind was one to three dollars a pound. So great was the suffering among the very poor that all children under twelve were sold for food in order to keep others from starving. A boy or girl under fourteen was not safe in the street. You could go in any shop and ask for steak chops or stew meat. Part of the naked body of a boy or girl would be brought out, and just what you wanted cut from it. A boy or girl's behind, which is the sweetest part of the body, and is sold as veal cutlets, brings the highest price. John stayed there so long that he acquired a taste for human flesh. On his return to NY, he stole two boys, one seven, one eleven. He took them to his home, stripped them naked, and tied them up in a closet. And then he burned everything they had on. Several times every day and night, he spanked them, tortured them, to make their meat good and tender. First, he killed the eleven-year-old boy because he had the fattest ass and, of course, the most meat on it. Every part of his body was cooked and eaten except the head, bones, and guts. He was roasted in the oven, all of his ass. Boiled, boiled, fried, and stewed, the little boy was next, and he went the same way. At that time, I was living at 409 East 100th Street. He told me so often how good human flesh was, and I made up my mind to taste it. On June 3rd, 1928, I called you at 406 West 15th Street and brought you pot cheese and strawberries. We had lunch. Grace sat on my lap and kissed me. I made up my mind to eat her. On the pretense of taking her to a party, you said yes, she could go. I took her to an empty house in Westchester. I had already picked out when we got there. I told her to remain outside. She picked wild flowers. I went upstairs and stripped all my clothes off. I knew if I did not, I would get her blood on them. When all was ready, I went to the window and called her. Then I hid in the closet until she was in the room. When she saw me all naked, she began to cry and tried to run down the stairs. I grabbed her, and she said she would tell her mama. First, I stripped her naked. How she did kick, bite, and scratch, I choked her to death. 
then cut her in small pieces so I could take the meat to my rooms. Cook and eat it. How sweet and tender her little ass was roasted in the oven. It took me nine days to eat her entire body. I did not fuck her, though I could have if I wished. She died a virgin.